So Sonny Barger is a founding member of the Oakland chapter of Hell's Angels. He now lives in Arizona, he's 81 years old, is a member of the Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona chapter of Hell's Angels. And the credo of his life, he has written in books and has said many times, treat me good, I'll treat you better. Treat me bad, I'll treat you worse. It's a way to live. It's a choice, it's a credo. I don't think you have to be a 1% motorcycle gang guy to live that way. I think lots of people live that way. They may never say it quite like that. But this morning I want to show you a different kind of payback. A different way of living in this world where there are insults and hurts and abuse and evil. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we've been working our way through this book written by this friend of Jesus, a fisherman by trade, who followed Jesus and learned from him, and then took the time to write out some things for us to grow through. He said in chapter 3, verse 9, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. It's a different way to live, it's a different kind of payback, it's a different credo for life. This Peter writes this to the original readers and to us all these years later because of his encounter with Jesus, because of his experience with Jesus for several years, and for what he learned from him, he passes on to us as a way to live our lives. I'll show you a little bit later how exactly in his journey Peter got to this place. It was only because of a relationship with Jesus that changed his mind and changed his life. Let me read that verse for you again and have us think through it this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 begins, Don't repay evil with evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. This is what God has called you to, and he will grant you his blessing. So the desire and the temptation and the sort of natural hard wiring to retaliate uh, is sort of built into a lot of us and we have to work hard to think about why am I like that? So I did a little digging this week into thinking about what it is that prompts us to return evil for evil, insult for insult. You hit me, I'll hit back. You speak rudely to me, I'll speak rudely to you. What is it about us that makes us respond that way? I got three things. The first is that it, for some of us, it's just a reflex. It's just a completely automatic response. We don't think about it. Um, it just happens automatically. Um, if you do need to justify it, oftentimes we'll say, well, he started it. And you don't have to be a third grader to say that. Um, lots of adults maybe won't say it, but think it and say, I would never start a fight, but if you start a fight with me, I'll finish it. Um, sometimes we justify our returning insult for insult or hurt for hurt by saying they've got it coming. After what they did, they should not get away with that, and so they've got it coming to them. So it's an automatic reflex response. For some of us, it's a defensive mechanism, just... Um, a matter of self-preservation. We think that if, if I don't answer back, I'll just get swallowed by this abuse. I, I just will be overwhelmed, and not only this person, but every other person who watches my life will say, you can say anything, you can do anything to this person, and they'll never strike back. They'll never fight back. There's a third reason I think sometimes we do it. Some of us are really just competitive, and we want to win. And so if this feels like a game or a contest or a war, we are not about to lose. We just want to win. We're all about keeping score. We're all about scoring points. And we're never satisfied with getting even. We want to get the best. And Peter says, don't live that way. When you are insulted, don't retaliate. When someone says something, does something that wounds, hurts, or offends you, don't pay it back. In fact, he says, live a completely different way. 
So I got to thinking this week, not only about sort of these inborn things in us that make us want to retaliate and sort of hardwired to retaliate, I also thought a lot of our entertainment is about retaliation. A lot of the things that we read and movies that we watch in include a fair amount of payback, not at all like what Peter is telling us to do. Um, so some of the things that I've read recently, um, you know, some of the characters that are notorious for payback are uh, Jack Reacher, uh, Mitch Rapp, Jack Ryan, Gabriel Alon, The Gray Man, uh, movies like Rambo. You know that in the movies this week, Rambo 5, I haven't seen it yet, I, I think it's Sylvester Stallone on a walker. I mean, how long ago was Rambo 1? Um, you remember Rambo 1? He, um, he says uh, famously, Rambo says famously to his colonel, um, I didn't start it. He drew first blood. Like that was justification for retaliating. Well, the name of the last movie, Rambo 5, is called Last Blood. If only... Uh, so you're going to get a chance to talk about movies and books and stuff in connect groups this week that maybe fuel into the revenge, avenging. In fact, the, the number one box office in the United States and around the world for 2019 is Avengers Endgame. I'm not sure if it's really going to be the Endgame or not, but it certainly is about avenging. And so it's all over us. In fact, I think that the climate that we live in, the, the stream that we swim in is all flowing naturally in the direction more of Sonny Barger's view of life than Jesus and the Apostle Peter. So the Apostle Peter says to us, don't retaliate when you feel like it. Don't retaliate when you have an opportunity to. Don't retaliate when you think you're justified in doing it. Don't return insult for insult, evil for evil. Do something totally different and totally unexpected. Then he quotes from the Old Testament, from Psalm 34. So the next several verses, the Apostle Peter has lifted out of the Old Testament. Now, uh, he probably knew these verses from childhood. He probably heard the rabbi talk about them in the synagogues where he grew up. Uh, his mom may have even talked with him about these verses. And so he knew them. Um, the Psalms and the prophets and the Torah were the only Bible Jesus had. Uh, they were the only Bible that Peter and the apostles had. And so he draws from that Old Testament reservoir, that library of wisdom from hundreds of years before Jesus, and connects some dots and says... This way of living, of not returning evil for evil, has always been God's plan for us. So he quotes from Psalm 34. Look at 1 Peter 3, verse 10. He says, for the scriptures, Psalm 34, say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lie. Show of hands, and I, I really mean this. If you're awake right now, um, who wants to live a happy life? Who wants to live a long life? So the apostle quoting the psalmist from hundreds of years before Jesus said, here's the way to have a happy life. Don't do the retaliation that you're tempted toward. In fact, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Um, you see, the psalmist and here Peter is saying, our problem is with what we say. A problem is with what comes out of our mouths. And unfortunately, we've spent an awful lot of time before Jesus and since Jesus worried about what goes into our mouths, food and drink, and we've had all kinds of rules. And here's what Jesus once said in Matthew 15. He says, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You're defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. This was Jesus speaking to a bunch of people who never ate shrimp, lobster, or scallops. Now, they did drink wine. Um, since Jesus, we've eaten shrimp, lobster, and scallops, but we don't drink wine. And Jesus says neither of those matter. What matters is what comes out of our mouths. We've spent so much energy worrying about what we eat and what we drink, 
and so little effort given to what we say. And here's the psalmist, and here's Peter, and here's Jesus saying, what really matters is what comes out of your mouth. Here's how I'd summarize it. Holiness is much less about what we put into our mouths, eating and drinking, and much more about what comes out of our mouths, especially when we are treated unfairly, unkindly, or unjustly. Peter goes on to quote the psalm and says, turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. So there are three imperatives in that verse. Turn away, that's an active, physical, okay, you've received evil, you can be swallowed up by it, you can follow into it, or you can turn away from it. And sometimes I think what he is saying is you just gotta turn on your heel and walk away. Then he says, if you do good, you need to search for peace. You need to look for a way to not escalate the war of words. You, you need to search for peace. And then I'm gratified that he says it won't come easy. It'll take work to maintain it. Uh, turning away is not an easy thing for some of us to do. Uh, searching for peace when someone is hammering us is not an easy thing for some of us. It will take work for us to do in the power of the Spirit. But he gives us those three imperatives from the psalm that says turn away from the desire to, to return evil for evil. Uh, work for peace. Look for peace. Search for peace. Try to find some way in this conversation not to return insult for insult. He goes on in verse 12, says, The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. So he said three things to us by way of imperatives, commands. Here he says three things about the Lord, and he gives him eyes, ears, and a face. Notice he says the eyes are watching over those who do right. That's a good thing for the Lord to watch over us. It's a good thing that he is paying attention to our lives and that he sees us. And it says here that his eyes are on us when we do right, when we do good. He says that his ears are open to the prayers of those who do this, which begs the question, are his ears ever closed to our prayers? I don't know, Peter elsewhere said to husbands, you should treat your wives with respect so that your prayers will be answered. Suggesting that there are things we can do to make God tone deaf to our prayers. That's a message for another day, perhaps. But then he says the third thing, that he turns his face. God turns his face, not away, but against those who do evil. All in the context of our mouths, our conversation, our retaliations with words. Peter quotes the Old Testament. It was the only scripture he had when he's writing this letter. And I think that the Old Testament informed his view, but I tell you what really shaped the life of Peter that makes him write these, frankly, almost impossible to believe words. Don't return evil for evil. Don't return insult for insult. It was his association with Jesus. It was his life with him watching me. He heard him say these things about not returning evil, but more than hearing Jesus say them, he saw him live this out right up to the cross. On the night that Jesus was arrested, Peter and some others were with him in the garden. A Judas came up to Jesus and gave him that kiss on the cheek that it identified him to the soldiers and the temple guards who were armed and ready to arrest Jesus. Peter, impulsive and defensive, I don't know what else he said, but I know what he did. He withdrew a small sword from under his tunic and lopped off the ear of a servant of a temple official. Jesus said to him, Peter, put your sword away. And then he restored the man's ear miraculously in that moment. And he said to Peter, these words that we've heard, and I know you know them, and we have such a hard time living by them, he said, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. He said, that's not how we do things. That's not how we are going to live in this kingdom 
of God. Uh, we're not going to retaliate with swords. We're not going to retaliate with words. I don't know the impact on Peter, but later that night, uh, Jesus was led, bound, hand and foot, under arrest, uh, and was taken to the courtyard of the high priest where Jesus went into the house, Peter and some others hung out by the fire out on the courtyard. It was a cold winter evening. And he was warming himself by the fire. And for the third time that night since the sun went down, someone said, Hey, you're a Galilean. I, can, I recognize your accent. You're not from around here. You're not Jerusalem guys. You're Galilee guys. You say y'all and stuff like that. <laughs> and for the third time that night, Peter said, I don't know him. In fact, this third time, it was a little servant girl who thought she could recognize a Galilean. Peter swore, it doesn't say it in the text that he swore like a marine, but I think it was. Well, he was a sailor, so he swore like a sailor, like a fisherman, like a man who had earned his living his whole life working in the sun and had blisters on both hands. And I don't know what bombs he dropped, but he swore that he didn't know Jesus. Jesus overheard him. In fact, out the window, made eye contact with him. Peter beat it out of there and wept bitterly for what he had just done. You know the rest of the story that Jesus was crucified the next day and was buried. Um, on the Sunday morning, Peter and John and others went to the tomb, eventually saw that Jesus was raised from the dead. The first time they were back together again, Jesus meets Peter on the beach, on, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he's fixed breakfast for them. And he looks at Peter and makes eye contact with Peter. And if it were you or me, wouldn't you say, Pete, we got some talking to do. Uh, we got some history to revisit. We got some things to clarify about what I heard you say. And Jesus did none of that. He turned to Peter and said, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? You know I love you. Do you love me? All Jesus could talk about with this guy who betrayed him, who swore that he didn't know him, was love. Instead of retaliating, instead of returning, instead of putting him in disciple time out, he just spoke to him about love. I think it is that singular experience that transformed the life of Peter so that he says, when you're insulted, don't return insult for insult. When you're offended, don't return offense for offense. When you are treated evil, don't return evil for evil. I need to say just a word about abusive relationships because I know that it would be possible to sit and listen to a message like this and think that that's the only truth there is from the scriptures that says don't return evil for evil. And I don't mean to discount it or wipe it away, but I do need to say that if you are in an abusive relationship where you are punched or hit or kicked or beat down verbally or treated badly, don't retaliate. Don't join that war. Don't return evil for evil. But I also need you to hear, you don't need to stay in an abusive relationship like that. You should get help. You should let others know, someone you trust, someone with some power, someone that can help you, someone, maybe someone from HR, maybe a pastor in your church, maybe a counselor or a trusted family member can stand up for you and help you not take and live with that kind of abuse. So you hear a message like this today, and there are two ways to respond to it. Maybe more than two, but thankfully I only thought of two. Aren't you glad I didn't have seven ways? 
Uh, the first is to focus on behavior and deciding what is right. And that's an outside-in sort of approach that says, I'm going to manage my temptation. I'm going to manage my desire to retaliate. I'm going to keep control of my mouth. I'm going to work really hard not to say what I want to say. Y you ever been in a place where somebody says something mean to you and snarky and it hurts and you, and you don't respond? And, and then later at dinner at home, you're telling your family about it and somebody says, oh, what you should have said. And they have some zinger that you think, oh, I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> uh, be glad that you didn't. So one way to respond is to say, I'm going to take care of my behavior. I'm going to make sure that I, I do what Peter says here, and I, and I don't do what he says not to do. And, and I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do. It's, it's overriding every urge to retaliate. Um, it is practicing self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit, and is a good thing. But I want to show you a better way. I want to show you an even, even deeper way to respond when you're treated badly. It's a matter of asking God to give you a whole new heart and brand new desires. Where your deepest desire is to be like Jesus, not to retaliate. Where he can actually come in and, and not just have you manage the sin that you're tempted toward, but he can change your heart from the inside that says, I'm no longer that person. I no longer respond reflexively, automatically that way. I now have the spirit of Jesus in me and he gives me a whole new heart. I'll tell you, when you know you've gotten there is when you are more repulsed by your own sin than someone else's. Oh, we're really good at being turned off by other people's sin, aren't we? This kind of new heart says, the sin that bothers me the most in the whole world is not my neighbors, not my spouses, not the boss that I have that I think is a jerk. It, the sin that bothers me the most is the sin from my own life. And I want to invite you this morning to ask Jesus to do for you what he did for Peter and give you a whole new heart. Then behaviors change, but it's not sin management. It's not even self-control. It is changed from the inside out. It's a whole new way of thinking and living and feeling and speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're thinking, I can, I can never do that. You're right, you can't, but he can. And, and Jesus lived his life and died his death for us. Not just to forgive our sins, but to change our lives from the inside out. He did this all the way to the cross. About 800 years before Jesus went to the cross, the prophet Isaiah, writing prophetically in advance about the coming Messiah, the Savior, he said he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep he is silent before the shearers. He did not open his mouth. 800 years before Jesus God was already putting in the heart of a prophet to say, this is who he'll be. This is how he'll live. And I want you to know, this is why he came, not just to be a model, but to give us his power, to give us his life, to give us a whole new heart to live like he lives. So Isaiah said he never opened his mouth, and you know that's I get his point, but technically... The gospel says in Luke chapter 23 that when he finally did open his mouth from the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Of all the things he could have said. Uh, incidentally, they had taunted him from the cross, saying he saved others. He was well known for healing people, for raising Lazarus from the dead. He was well known around Jerusalem for his miraculous gifts and powers. They taunted him and said he saved others, but he can't save himself. What would you have said to that? Oh yeah, watch this. <laughs> he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
this life of Jesus, this way of the cross, is the kind of life he calls us to. I, I doubt if yours will end up on a cross. I doubt if mine will end up on a cross. But there may be some insults along the way. There may be some evil done against us along the way. There may be some hurt and pain. And Jesus wants to take it all away and say, I give you a whole new heart. And you will never again engage in that war of payback. I want to invite the communion servers to come and prepare Holy Communion for us to receive the body and blood of the Savior given for us for the forgiveness of our sins, but more than that, to give us a whole new life. Jesus said, this is real food and this is real drink. This just doesn't nourish your body. It changes your heart. It changes your soul from the inside out. The Apostle Peter writing to us says, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That's what God called you to do. And he will grant you his blessing. This is the word of the Lord. And everyone said,